Bert Thayton. Just your name. Oh, Julie Barton. Okay. Cornelius, maiden right. name. Okay. Julie, we uh, interviewed you earlier when we had to break it off. Um, and up to that point, we had covered your parents, your grandparents, and um, where you had lived and where you went to school. And we brought it up to just about the point of um, uh, your children and when you moved back to Oneida. And maybe you could, uh, and, your, and you mentioned your husband's name. Uh, maybe you could uh, tell us again, you were living in Chicago and you uh, bought a house out here at the time. Do you, can you refresh us about that? Oh, okay. Um, I, when we moved here, the uh, move was um, quite traumatic, I, should, I guess I could say, for all of us, really, because not that I didn't want to be here, but because uh, my children had, our oldest son was 10 years old, and uh, he, they all had, well, they were all in school except Kendall, and they were used to their friends, and we had a nice neighborhood, we had new people, uh, and so it was adjusting, and um, that period of adjustment, and I think because we wanted to be here, it made it a little easier. Um, but I didn't have a phone at first, and because we had to wait until our deposit cleared and everything, and then the installation and whatever. So I was there at um, the house of five kids, and my husband, of course, was still in Chicago. And we um, didn't see, we were, it seemed like we were cut off from communications. And so it was, but it worked out okay. Everybody was doing all right, and at times uh, uh, the older children would. Um, Express their um, their loneliness for their old home on 21st and and um, Western Avenue, and and their friends. But then a friend started visiting, and uh, we then we'd go back and visit. So that exchange went on for quite a while, and we had lifelong friends from living in that neighborhood. But the adjustment here uh, became easier because. I don't think I was back more than a week or two, and Joyce and Ham uh, knocked on my door and said hi, you know. And of course, I knew her, and we visited and got, you know, caught up on old times. And she came back a few days later with I mean more, and of course we visited. And then again, um, Alberta Baird meanwhile stopped by to visit. So during the course of two to three weeks, all three of them had been coming and going. By the end of the third week, I believe it was, uh, they had convinced me to volunteer. For s I don't even recall what it was for. And I said, well, I've got all these kids, you know, and I don't, you know, didn't have a car. I didn't have a license even then. Um, and they said, don't worry, we'll pick you up. We'll, we'll bring the kids. And, um, so we'd pile all the kids in the car and we'd go somewhere and do something. And that went on for um, for quite a while and then all the, the school started and so I got to do more and more things with them because the older ones were all in school. And so most of the stuff Irene was interested in were um, education events and things that needed, she felt were real important to take place in the community. Uh, so. That's how I got involved in that. And of course, Joy was always there with her car, and Alberta was. And um, Alberta always had um, a car with um, a stick shift, and, um, and, we, and she, was, um, she was a fast driver, and we always laughed at her for that. But she always got us here, there and back safely, wherever we went. And, and some of the stuff was just social. We'd go to different things around the community, but a lot of our days were taken up with volunteering for something. And so we did that um, oh, for about, about a year. And then um, they needed some people for, and I went and started going to the tribal meetings. And I had gone to tribal meetings whenever I could while I was, while I was gone away. And I guess everyone remembers the old CC camp. And I remember going there when I was a really young woman. And um, the old stove was burning in the middle, and somebody would feed it some wood and so forth. And that um, ended with the meetings 
the purchase of the school building, Chicago Corner School Building. And just about that same time, the, um, there was an election going on and they needed volunteers for the election. So I volunteered. And from then on, it was trouble business all the way. Um, and and uh, two years later then, in 1969, the Constitution was changed to have five council members. There were four officers, and the, current, the old Constitution, the new Constitution, said that uh, there would be an addition of five council members, a total of nine. And um, so I volunteered, uh, by, I guess you'd call it volunteer, but I ran for council, and I got the position and served for three years on that. Uh, I found that it was a little bit too much yet to, because the tribal again was growing and things were picking up speed and there was more and more work to do. So I didn't run for the term after I finished that term. And um, we had, um, it, it was uh, a time of struggle financially for the tribe. And there were um, things that I guess we, we all saw what we needed so badly in terms of um, health care and education and, and so on. There are many, many details, I guess, when I say health and education to fit in those areas. And I guess we know from experience what those were. You know, it was difficult to find a college graduate to fill some new positions that were created. The health conditions were... Um, it were pretty devastating to individuals, especially our elders who didn't, couldn't get the proper care they needed. And so um, those of us who were volunteering and those of us who served on the, the business committee were aware of all that. And we had the uh, many of our older women who just took up causes and went for it and went all the way and got the projects like um, like the nursing home. And we always talk about that because that was one of our major uh, areas. In, and then our, our health services started as well. And that Josephine Odenhoven was one of the uh, individuals who administered the Indian Health Service uh, money. And that was, um, and she did that from her house. She had her little office there, and the money came in, and, and um, Jordanham was a treasurer, and then accounts were opened up into utilize that those funds and we did very well with that um, and then that started to grow and funds started increasing and that's again because certain people took up this cause for to meet the need uh, the health services group and then um, we went into our health center and, and on the corner of E and of course, you know, and now we have our beautiful new one this year of 2004. And, um, you know, the, so we've come a long way in, in pro helping to uh, meet the needs of individuals using our resources in the best way possible. And um, education certainly has come a long way, and that was Irene Moore's uh, cause. She um, would do just about anything she could to improve the education. And I was kind of always behind her with the um, volunteering, even if it was like begging flowers from a neighbor to put vases on a table so we could have a banquet. And we had those little banquets at um, Chicago Corners honoring our high school graduates. Then we started honoring college graduates. And now, you know, we've got hundreds and hundreds of people who are graduating. Um, so I guess that progress, it's, it's just, it's great to sit here and just talk about that progress because sometimes you take it for granted because you're doing this every day in and, uh, and what I do. Um, but meanwhile, back at, when I finished the term in 1969, I, um, my husband and I ran a small um, fast food restaurant right in uh, uptown Oneida. And we did that for about three years. and. Um, at the time, we didn't have the resources to expand. We, if we had a chance to stay in that place, we could have um, probably um, waited another three years or so, and we would have had a, enough resources to buy a piece of land. But, and again, when you got a young, growing family, it's a little difficult to uh, take that time out and, and uh, develop a business. So we just went on about our work, and 
Um, and then in, um, then I went back to school, went to UWGB, did a lot of work with education again, filling in for a lot of people who took maternity leave or sick leave and so forth, and worked in, as a, a homeschool coordinator with, and in the various schools, uh, and also in the language program. Um, the language program was just developing, and um, I need a Kleenex. <laughs> Oh, sure. Oh. Uh, I don't know. Okay. 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 We're good. Okay. Okay. Now, where were we? You were we talking were about uh, the language program, and that was a, that was 1971 or 72, and um, the language program began. And I was part of it, and um, really enjoyed that experience because I got to uh, establish many relationships with our elders, and and got not only language but history, um, the culture, uh, some of our crafts, uh, just just about everything that I, you know that those people knew, and most of them are gone. Um, so I, I I look back as that as being such a valuable experience because they're no longer with us, and some of that may get lost because I know that I can't teach basket making. Uh, I I know the language, I can understand a lot of it, I but I don't know it to the extent that I can converse. Um, and you know we have a, uh, an individual here now by the name of Mary McDonald. And she's um, going to do some total immersion work with people, but I um, and and Bob Brown, we have to import, so to speak, our native speakers now. And uh, and I went to a seed ceremony on Saturday, and heard Leander and some of our other Oneida people will learn the language and know that it's not going to die; it is going to be with us. Um, even if we have to import native speakers, which we value very much, except that I know that there are people who are dedicated. And I hope that when I retire, that I can ha spend a greater part of my time or dedicate the rest of my life to the language. Because I think, I'm not sure how much will pass on for me, but it's just something that I feel like I gotta do. And, and I probably will do it because I know that the Culture Center has everything that you need to become a, a fluent speaker. And I may not become a fluent speaker, but I know that many other people will have that opportunity. Um, so what I do after that? Uh, oh, then I went, I knew while I was raising my children, and holding various jobs, mostly temporary ones, just to help out, and um, decided that I didn't want to go back to school because I, I thought now it's time for me to start working full time and contributing more to the family resources. So I, I started out at NWTC and I was going to be an accountant because I thought I was going to make all this money and I was going to be able to you know, make this great living and, and do what we needed to do. But I got there and I spent about a year and I found that it was not what I wanted to do because I started to take other courses, excuse me, uh, that um, really had nothing to do with accounting. <laughs> um, and I knew I was on the wrong track. And so someone said, well, why don't you go out and see Norbert Hill? He's the um, admissions counselor for uh, Indian students at UWGB. And I went out there and I said, Norbert, we just want to talk. I, I just want to know, what is it like to go to college? I kind of knew, but I, I just wanted to, to get some feedback from him so he could tell me, what is it like? And because I, I told him about my schooling at NWTC, and then I knew that I really didn't want to be there, even though I enjoyed the education experience. And he said, well, do you want, you want to go to school here? And I said, well, I want to hear from you first. Tell me about it. 
So he just told me a little bit. He said, well, what do you think? I said, you know, it's, I think it's probably what I want to do. He said, come on. And he took my hand, and we went to register. And I was scared because I thought, oh, my God, you know, can I do this? And before I knew it, I was registered, and I was, it was like in um, June or July, and I was, and I started in September, and so I went for human development, and I never really finished. I've got nine credits, but I've got about 160, 170 credits all over the place, actually, for different um, courses that I took, but I just have nine left for UWGB, and I would still like to do that just to have accomplished that goal. And I, I always kind of put it on the back burner because something else came up. And that something else was deciding to run for the business committee again in 1990. And I started out as the council member and served three years and then um, ran for secretary and re-ran for six more and have been re-elected for um, three terms, um, yeah, three more, this would be, uh, I've got one year left for this term, and that would have completed 18 years of service total on the business committee as a council member, two terms, and secretary for three. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to retire, and, and I think it's up to the people if, to make that decision. Uh, first I have to make it, then the people have to make that decision. And I always felt like when I run for office uh, and I'm campaigning, which I don't do a whole lot of, but still try to get out there and let people know that I still have everyone's interest at heart. But it's like being interviewed for a job by thousands of people. <laughs> and, and I do this every three years. And, and some of my relatives, especially one of my daughter-in-law, said, um, like, how can you do that? You know, it's like, how can you run every year? You don't know if you're going to have a job every three years. Or how, you know, it's like as if it, it would um, be a, a, a real dilemma. But it hasn't been for me. It's just like I, I know that if people trust that I can do it, I'm, I do the right thing, they'll make that decision. And I, um, so I've tried to carry that out to the fullest extent. And making sure that people um, aren't in abrupt change. People don't mind change, um, but my thinking about serving the people is to make sure when you change that it comes about in a gradual way so that people understand it and people know that it's, it's not going to disrupt their lives. And I um, and I, I admire some of the new thinking and uh, philosophy, um, but there and there needs to be a balance, a balance of energy and youth and uh, new ideas, along with the middle ground, and then then the some of, and the elders and how so. I think we've been pretty well represented on the business committee with that. Um, even though sometimes the people don't plan it that way, that's kind of how it happens. So we take that all in perspective and we put it into balance and, and hopefully our ideas are all um, integrated to serve the people. And so um, what my plans are, I guess, for the future, I haven't really thought about you know retiring yet and yet it's starting to look pretty good. <laughs> um, they, um, I guess there's, there's many things that, issues I guess that our community needs to look at for the future and that's the culture and language of course. We can't let those die. Um, the um, culture also includes all of us no matter what we believe in. It could be the um, any type of spirituality and how we live. It's not like learning arts and crafts. It's a philosophy. It's a, a gut feeling of being Oneida. And with that, we'll survive because when we lose that, we're 
probably going to be integrated and someday we're, we're not going to be, you know, as these problematas with this heritage. That's what links us to the future. Um, there are um, the outside influences that always um, we, we think are a threat. And actually, I don't see them as a threat. I see them as a challenge. I see Washington as a challenge, M Madison as a challenge, our local governments as a challenge, because I think every time we have to um, take some of these issues, we have to look at our sovereignty first. And when you look at your sovereignty, and you have to do that quite often, you know sovereignty is where it's at, especially in our, our go in administrating our government. And uh, so when those things come about, you know, sh we have to spend a lot of resources, a lot of time, we get angry, we get frustrated. But it's a challenge, and it's, it's, we can't, otherwise, if we don't take that challenge, it, everything will be going away. We will, you know, have these threats become stronger and stronger. Um, so I think there's just, um, if, if our new people come in feeling that sovereignty is where it's at, Oneida, Oneida is where it's at, Oneida people are where it's at, everything else will fall into place. And um, no matter if you're, no matter what your uh, approach to government is, if it's aggressive, it's change, if it's, if it's um, any, any kind of other philosophy, but the basic philosophy has to be protecting our sovereignty and protecting everything that we know to be Oneida. And um, so our government is going to change again in another year, and this year, these past two years have gone by so quickly. I, I just look at it as, as saying, what can you do in three years? Well, you can do a lot, and yet sometimes it just, it, and yet it takes the time for the people to help make that change. So it's not always so um, rapid as we'd like it to be. Um, excuse me again. I gotta take some, go home for lunch and take some sinus tablets. <laughs> um, let's see, what else is it? Well, um, your first term on the committee versus the, the next, you, you, and you had a break, then you went into your the second cycle, so to speak. Was there uh, a great deal of change, or was, were things pretty much the same? Well, I didn't notice it so much because I was always involved. I, you know, I never kind of had a break, like, you know, cut off and just went off and didn't do anything with the tribe because even I even had uh, part-time jobs while I was going to school raising my family, and all my jobs were with the tribe. I tried a couple of ones on the outside and um, didn't work, not because I didn't want it to, but because one of them, I didn't have a car, a reliable transportation. And um, and then the babysitting and child care was a problem too. So it was easier for me to be here and kind of work part-time and fill in type jobs because of that. And then I, when I did start working full-time, it was the flexibility is there, and that's one of the advantages, I think, that most of our, our tribal people who work, they get to uh, have the flexibility, especially working mothers with children, because everybody would understand at the time, and maybe it's not so much today as it was then, where they knew if your child was sick, that you had to do, you had to be there with them, and if you had something to do, you could do it tomorrow or, or do it later this afternoon. Children were so important to the people who ran programs and and so forth that flexibility was there. And so for that, I really feel like, you know, I got through this stage of holding a job and, and, and even going to school. Um, but the changes, again, from the first time I served to from 1970, no, 72 to 1990, um, 
I always needed my brother to come from Kansas City, and my brother Harrison, he's since passed away. But he would always come here. He'd be here very often. He was injured, and then he retired from the federal government um, position. But he, he, in the summertime, he'd be here once a month, even sometimes. But he'd always see the progress, and he'd always point it out. And sometimes when you're here, and you're just <coughs> going from place to place and living in here, you don't always notice it. Even though you appreciate it, you just don't notice it. But he would be here and he'd say, wow, you guys did this and you did that. And he'd be pointing out and then I'd say, oh yeah, I guess we did. And so as he got older I and mean, he started having, uh, he had a stroke and then he had, he had more strokes, he started coming here less and less. So uh, two years ago he died. But before that, or up until that time, even the last time he came, it was like he knew the health center was being built, and he, he was just all, all, in awe over what we had accomplished with the health center. So he thought it was, um, uh, he didn't get to see it, but he thought it was going to be a great place. And so I think after he died, I kind of took that attitude and said, hey, got to take more notice of what's going on in this community, you know. Um, even though you do, uh, but you don't really, you, you know, I guess point it out to yourself even. Um, so it's it's been um, a real challenge to look at progress, I guess, and, and really say to yourself, why did we do this and, and then did we do that? And um, because we've had so much happening, I guess, maybe that's why we take a little bit for granted. Because if it isn't one building, it's another, and something else is changing, something's growing. Uh, we got a little more of this and a little more of that. Uh, you know, I was looking at the trees at the, by the, the little golf course and thinking uh, there must be about more than a thousand trees there, you know, and, and he, about 20, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, a lot of us couldn't afford trees, couldn't go afford to go out and pay 10, 20 dollars for a tree, and here we got, a, you know, more than a thousand of them just growing like weeds now, and you could see them really making progress before when they were in the weeds, you couldn't see them very well, now you, you know, they're about six, eight feet tall, and to me, that's progress, and when we can afford to have that many trees, and I see people um, taking care, of, good care of their uh, their surroundings, their their recycling, um, taking better care of their yards, and um, repairing their homes, and keeping their um, their children well fed, dressed, and. You know, some that's progress. You, you, you don't have to always have physical things, um, but just the environment around you that you care about. That's kind of the basis of it all. You know, there's spirituality and there's um, your immediate surroundings that um, are not so much tangible, but they're just there for you to, to enjoy along with the tangible, with your car. Um, he always I've mentioned that he doesn't see the res runners around anymore like he used to. And, and I know what a res runner is because I, uh, I've had one, my family's had one, one or two through the years, and aren't actually many of them. So we've kind of come a long way. Um, and we're able to, you know, buy better quality food for ourselves and, and just some of those basic things. and getting to and from places that uh, we can, uh, we need to go enjoying children, grandchildren, school events, and all things like that. So um, that's progress. We couldn't get there before. You know, we had to hire somebody or we really, really didn't go we had a school bus. And uh, so there's there's just a lot of hap lots happening. Uh, what kind of recommendation do uh would you give to the youth that are coming? Um, well, uh, 
Well, there's there's one that one area I guess that I have a message for our women, our girls, our young girls, and that is to really take care, really good care of your body. Um, to take good care of yourself because that body that you carry with you and it's going to be there the rest of you as long as you live has to maintain your emotional health your physical health and your spiritual health it also has to um, put a message to your children your newborn babies um, and how your children grow and um, I guess most young women don't learn that in school. If your parents need to either tell you that, look at relatives or or your parents, and, and help your parents to help you understand what it means to be a growing woman in this country. And the first part of that is respect for your own body and how you use your body. Is, is will predict how things will be for your future. Um, you know, there's so many things happening in this world. That, uh, it happens. Sometimes you can control it, sometimes you can't. Um, diseases, um, the unfortunate um, events of teen pregnancy, early teen pregnancy. Um, all of them, you know, are, affect the future of that young woman's life and the future as a parent or grandparent. And um, some of the things I learned along the way was, um, I, I, I learned through fear, I guess. <laughs> um, that was kind of real late. My, you know, was a, there was a, this horrible fear of certain diseases that my grandmother and my mother always talked about. They never really pinpoint it was, but I had a guess as I grew, and uh, kind of fill in the blanks. But the message was there, and other messages as well. And you know, um, you, you certain places to stay away from, certain things, and you know, so you can get in trouble. And for the better part, I guess I was lucky, because <laughs> um, that fear bad for all. I look at it as being um, something that protected me really from getting into really big trouble. Uh, so, because I did leave, at, you know, when I was 13, and by the time I was 14, I was pretty much self supporting So, um, I needed that fear to guide me, I guess. And that was, um, but now it seems there really is that fear it's out there. It's kind of just do it. And I would hope that even young parents who already have children, they would give some good messages to their children and how to take care of themselves, um, their personal selves, their spiritual selves, and um, we can do it through our services, or maybe other messages that, um, like mentors or people at at the school, uh, uh, places, or other women that we know in our families, because those message are, messages are so important for them to grow up healthy and strong for the next generation. Um, because uh, I don't see a lot of that happening. A lot of messages on television, and that um, on one hand, one event can be so fabulous, and you know, in the public. And then on the other hand, it isn't. So, you know, the soap operas versus the Super Bowl events. Uh, and those mixed messages, what are we telling the kids? But if that's what the media wants, and that's what the other world, outside world wants, then that's, you know, the freedoms are that, that are there. But we've got to have the people close to us, young people to give the right message because it takes some of that uh, confusion out of it so they can grow up healthy. And, um, but there's, um, there's a lot of choices 
many, many choices to be made in terms of what kind of health choices you want to make uh, for yourself, what kind of education choices you want to make for yourself. There's um, career choices. So when I left home, there were no choices left here. And maybe um, find somebody, I suppose, and I could have got married and and maybe existed because that was that was what was here. Uh, some people were lucky enough to have got jobs, you know, but it looked rather bleak at the time for as far as, you know, the future because there just wasn't a lot here, the choices to be made. But now I hope that we can keep our young people here because they have a lot of choices. And if they go off and get an education somewhere else, that they would have this inner feeling about being in Oneida where they would want to come back and, and you know be part of the community and share their uh, fortunes, their good fortunes of good health and, and education back here in Oneida. Um, and, and so many people think that um, there are certain things they have to do, and that's not the case. That they they just there's there's just um, a wealth of again I'll say the word choices to be made because there's 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 so many resources here, and um, and we have to provide a way to make sure that everyone knows what the choices are, but it's really up to the individual and. I think that, you know, people are beginning to realize that, um, and, and I really commend parents because uh, there's more of an role and they're taking advantage of education themselves, and which they probably didn't have when they were younger, and now, so it's, it's all there. Um, in terms of leadership, um, I would like to see young people think of not everyone wants to be a leader, but and that's okay because leadership doesn't mean maybe you're out in the forefront or in politics, that kind of stuff, but you're a leader because you're the, one of the best parents. Maybe you even did a volunteer parent kind of thing in the schools. Um, that's leadership, taking leadership, even writing your own home and making dis decisions that affect um, you know, how life will be in, for you and your family. Uh, but leadership, I guess, in terms of government, there is a, um, a strong need for that. And we always have to look at who are those nine people going to be? Uh, are they going to be? And I look, I mean, I've been part of it for 18 years, and I still look at who are those nine people going to be? And, and thinking, well, am I going to be one of them too? And, um, so the, the leadership there, again, is a, there's a strong need to develop, the development of that um, takes some time. It takes a, a knowledge of being, first of all, that gut feeling about being Oneida, taking that with you into that process, and being able to uh, know what sovereignty means and know um, <coughs> what it's like to to, to, well, maybe I'll describe it as having, and I was told this many years ago, that, and it's a cultural, um, uh, part of the culture, I guess, and, and I didn't know it at the time, but tribal leaders need to have seven layers of skin, and uh, I develop seven layers of skin because each time you develop a, a layer of skin, it makes you stronger. But that means you had to be humble to accept something, and then um, or go through an experience that's very, very uh, traumatic for you in serving. Government. So it apparently was something that was passed on or told to the chiefs as they were being groomed to become chiefs, and or the um, potential. I should. <coughs> so then they. If they, as each uh, layer of skin was um, developed, 
became a stronger and stronger leader. So by the time you got to seventh layer, you were a leader. And uh, being able to withstand a whole lot of things that occur. And, and so I think that sometimes our, our new government, our people who choose to run for the government for the first time, when they get there, they didn't realize, you know, how um, things happen. And I always kind of joke with some of our younger people and say, well, okay, you got through that one. Now you got your first layer of skin. Then something else will happen. And, else, and then they, 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 it's not something that's just easily ignored. It's, it's something, a major event. And I'll say, well, you got through your second one. You know, so I think tribal leadership, you know, needs that. Um, to, they need to understand that the events of life uh, when it comes to tribal government leaders, it, it can be, um, you do need those, another, you need to like grow another layer of skin because you would never survive. <laughs> uh, and so I, um, I don't even think that I've gotten that far okay. to the seventh layer, but uh, I'm getting close. <laughs> and, and so, um, but to not to give up because some event occurred that, that you just feel like it, uh, you know, can't cope with it, and and so. Um, there's always another event around the corner. Oh yeah, <laughs> and I, sometimes I think they're, they're, they they should have had that um, uh, cultural saying that maybe it mean more like fourteen layers or <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Um, but our leader, our young leadership, where you know I'm looking forward to seeing some of our younger people and. Um, take on that responsibility okay. and sometimes we have to scold them but it's it's a good scolding that's right because i got mine <laughs> and and you know from the older people and now I, you know every generation kind of has to come through that too and so but it's it's it can be really exciting and it can be um, very challenging it can be uh oh it can be almost anything you want to call it that and it probably uh, i would never ever find another job well, I'm close to retirement, so, but uh, there would never be a job that would be as interesting, exciting, challenging, uh, so fulfilling as this one, uh, you know, after all these years. So, uh, you know, one day you feel like, oh, I'll just go home and I won't do this anymore. But then you kind of drink another cup of coffee or talk to somebody that kind of lifts your spirit and it's over with. Or you go home and go to sleep and have a good night's sleep and you're ready for the next day. So it's it's not what people think it is, but we do need to have more and more people think that tribal government is a respectable body there to serve the people's needs and that we're not a political body com um, comparable to local governments, state governments, and that we're... It's forever uh, being challenged or, or um, downgraded because when we do that, really we're um, downgrading our own people, our own community. So if we don't like our leadership, it'll change in three years. So uh, we have a lot, I have a lot to think about for um when I retire, what I'm going to say and do for all this younger generation who keeps coming on board because I know what their work is going to be like. I know okay. what the government has to be, has to face. Well, we want to thank you for sharing this with mm -hmm. us today. And, okay. Uh, we appreciate it. And I think that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the young people will hopefully be able to take a look at these things and, and benefit from them in the future. Oh, yeah. So when is this project going to get done, Gordy? Oh, I, I'm not saying I got to have it done because I know Kathy and Mercy have been going working with you as far as the deadlines and stuff. Oh, like. um, um, you mean this this contract? Mm -hmm. uh, my contract ends in October. Oh, are you gonna, but that you still have a lot of wrap up and stuff yet to do. Uh, well, how does that work? Mm -hmm. We we got seventy interviews that we have to do this mm -hmm. year. Um, and right now we get about 255 interviews that we've done total, and we're probably about our. Uh
Probably about 45 that we've finished so far this year. Mm -hmm.